This morning we turn in the Old Testament to Deuteronomy chapter 10. A very beautiful and moving section of the law of God. I'll be reading from verse 12 through verse 22. Now Israel, what does the Lord your God require from you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways and love him, and to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and to keep the Lord's commandments and his statutes, which I am commanding you today for your good. Behold, to the Lord your God belong heaven and the highest heavens, the earth and all that is in it. Yet on your fathers did the Lord set his affection to love them, and he chose their descendants after them, even you above all peoples, as it is this day. So circumcise your heart and stiffen your neck no longer. For the Lord your God is the God of gods and the Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, and the awesome God, who does not show partiality nor take a bribe. He executes justice for the orphan and the widow and shows his love for the alien by giving him food and clothing. So show your love for the alien, for you were aliens in the land of Egypt. You shall fear the Lord your God. You shall serve him and cling to him, and you shall swear by his name. He is your praise, and he is your God, who has done these great and awesome things for you, which your eyes have seen. Your fathers went down to Egypt, seventy persons in all, and now the Lord your God has made you as numerous as the stars of heaven. Now in the New Testament, we turn to Acts chapter 16. This morning we're looking at verses 1 through 5. Paul came also to Derbe and to Lystra, and a disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek. And he was well spoken of by the brethren who were in Lystra and Iconium. Paul wanted this man to go with him, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those parts, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. Now while they were passing through the cities, they were delivering the decrees which had been decided upon by the apostles and elders who were in Jerusalem for them to observe. So the churches were being strengthened in the faith and were increasing in number daily. Let's pray and ask God's blessing. Lord, we thank you for your word of truth. Now bless this word to your people. May their hearts receive all that you have for them, that they might live in the light of your word. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. There are times in God's creation when the sun shines and the winds blow and the heart is filled with joy. Especially after a storm, the serenity that follows can be truly delicious. Paul and Barnabas had just come through a horrendous storm in their relationship. The argument over John Mark had turned into a sharp disagreement. And it only ended when these two co-laborers parted company and went their separate ways. Paul chose Silas and left for Syria and Cilicia, being committed by the brethren to the grace of the Lord. And meanwhile, Barnabas and Mark sailed off for ministry in Cyprus. Now we catch up with Paul and Silas, 
as they cross the Taurus range at the pass called the Cilician Gates. And there they enter into the southern region of Galatia and make for Derby and Lystra. And it's at Lystra that Luke's narrative picks up. So this morning we want to first of all focus on introducing Timothy. Then we're going to consider the question of circumcision and finish with strengthening the churches. Well, as a writer and a historian, Luke does a good job of introducing significant characters into his story. And when it comes to Timothy, we learn some important information about him here in chapter 16. This information is complemented by other biographical information about Timothy that Paul includes in his various epistles. So who is this Timothy character? Well, the first thing that we learn about Timothy is that he was the son of a Jewish woman and a Greek man. About his mother, we know a fair amount. From 2 Timothy 1.5, we learn that her name was Eunice. Moreover, Paul tells us there that Eunice's mother was named Lois. Lois possessed a sincere faith, which she passed down to and shared with Eunice. Eunice also was a believer. It is possible that both Lois and Eunice, and maybe even Timothy, were converted under Paul's preaching during his first missionary journey. He seems to have a close connection and a dear love for this family. He knows them by name, and he deals with them in a very tender sort of way. Another passage from 2 Timothy tells us something of their practice as a family. 2 Timothy 3.15 says, And that from childhood... You have known the sacred writings which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. So Mother Eunice and possibly even Grandmother Lois read and explained the Old Testament scriptures to baby Timothy from the earliest days of infancy. And in this way... They instructed young Timothy in the truth, and they gave him that wisdom that leads to salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. And so a faithful and believing mother laid the spiritual and theological groundwork for Timothy while he was a very impressionable little boy. And this is a very good reminder of the duties of parents, of Christian parents, to read and explain the scriptures to their children from infancy. And so little Felicity is not too young to be hearing the Bible read and hearing Jason and Emily explaining to her about Jesus and the salvation that he brings. Because even in those very early days, children are absorbing far more than they communicate back. I had a little sense of this watching Roman yesterday at the men and boys breakfast. Roman didn't participate in the conversation, <laughs> but he's such an attentive little guy. And every time I'd look at him, it was just clear he engages. He's not just sitting there like some mindless thing. Children just absorb. And, and as parents read the scriptures and explain the scriptures to their children, you are packing in truth, which will come to full fruition later on in life. 
for, for many, many years, I've thought that one of the best things my father and mother did for me was reading the Bible at the end of every meal and praying together. And by doing this, over 20 years, when I was under their roof, they gave me a very deep and thorough knowledge of the scriptures. So that when I came to faith in Christ myself, all of that truth that they had poured into me just kind of sat and now was useful to me. So ch children need to hear the scriptures read and parents need to be the ones reading. And as parents read and explain, the truth takes root in a young heart and mind. And that's what Lois and that's what Eunice were doing for little Timothy. They were laying the spiritual and theological groundwork for this child when he was still so impressionable. Well, what about Timothy's father? He was a Greek. And as such, he was a true Gentile and was never converted to Judaism. If he had been converted, then Timothy certainly would have been circumcised. But the fact of the matter is that Tim Timothy hadn't been circumcised, most likely because of his father's refusal to allow for this to take place. The picture we get of Eunice is that she's a dutiful and faithful Jewish woman. And certainly if she had had freedom by her husband, she would have brought Timothy for circumcision. But she is blocked, Timothy goes uncircumcised, and it seems that dad, the Greek, was the roadblock to that taking place. Well, there is another fact about this man that is probably true, though we can't prove it absolutely and conclusively. Most likely, Timothy's father was now dead. And perhaps he had been dead for a long time. This is suggested by the tense of the verb that is used in verse 3, that his father was a Greek. And I think it might be better translated, his father had been a Greek. The fact that there's no reference to the father, other than he was a Greek, there's no indication that he is part of Timothy's life. The fact that Paul basically adopts Timothy as his own son and treats him as a son would all seem to suggest that the father had been dead and was not now part of the scene. Well, for his part, Timothy was certainly well-liked by his fellow Christians. Verse 2 says that he was well-spoken of by the brethren who were in Lystra and Iconium. But the situation with Timothy goes far beyond some nice compliments from a few of his biggest fans. Timothy was actually ordained to the gospel ministry by a presbytery. This is explicitly stated in 1 Timothy 4, verse 14. Do not neglect the spiritual gift within you, which was bestowed on you through prophetic utterance with the laying on of hands by the presbytery. The presbytery ordained him. They laid hands on him. Commenting on that verse, William Hendrickson says, in all probability, this refers to what had happened at Lystra on Paul's second missionary journey. It was then that Timothy, by the operation of the Holy Spirit, had been amply endowed with this gift. Of this, and of the character of his task, he had been made aware through the prophetic utterance of inspired bystanders. Moreover, all of this was in association with the imposition of the hands of the presbytery. Paul's own hands had also rested upon him. 
This imposition of hands symbolizes the transfer of a gift from the giver to the recipient. So here, as Paul is there in Lystra, and he wants to take Timothy along as a helper, as part of the missionary team, the presbytery there says, let's ordain and commission Timothy so that he can go with you, Paul, as an ordained member of the team. And as they ordained him, this is not just an empty ceremony, but they are setting him apart for the gospel ministry, and a very significant spiritual gift is endowed upon Timothy through the laying on of hands and the prophetic utterances. And so Timothy is now set apart for kingdom work. He's ordained as a minister, and he has this extraordinary gift, which he will then use in ministry through the power of the Holy Spirit. So Luke is rather understated in verse 2 when he says, he was well spoken of by the brethren who were in Lystra and Iconium. Yeah, really well spoken of. So well spoken of that he's ordained for ministry. Now, Timothy was an unusually young person to be a minister. And in the coming years, some would look down upon him for his youthfulness. And Paul says, don't let them despise your youth. You've been set apart to this work. You are a minister in your own right. And you go ahead and carry out your ministry despite what people may say about you. We also know from the New Testament that Timothy tended to be naturally timid. He was not kind of the bold, swashbuckling guy that Paul was. He was understated. He was timid. In fact, sometimes too timid. And Paul had to tell him, you need to push a little harder. Don't let your natural human timidity overwhelm your ministry of the gospel. Because we have not been given a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power. And so here's this young man who kind of has to fight against his own natural shyness. He doesn't want to be out front and center, but that's where God has called him to be. And then one last little tidbit of information that we know about Timothy Apparently, Timothy occasionally suffered from stomach problems. He was not the healthiest minister ever. And this is why Paul has to counsel him to drink some wine for your stomach and not just water. So here's a person who's sometimes fighting with his own body and his own weaknesses. Now there is one matter that deserved more attention at that time, and it calls for our consideration also. It's the question of Timothy's circumcision. Though his mother was a Jewess, Timothy had not been circumcised. And this put Timothy in a very awkward position. F.F. Bruce says that in the eyes of the Jews, Timothy was a Gentile, because he was the uncircumcised son of a Greek. And in Gentile eyes, however, he was practically a Jew, having been brought up in his mother's religion. Now this would undoubtedly cause problems as Timothy joined Paul's team and sought to evangelize both Jew and Gentile. And Luke admits this. He said that, he was circumcised because the Jews who were in those parts, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. So Jewish opinion was really strong and was going to be a significant problem for him. Neither group, Jew or Gentile, would accept him uncritically. You might say that each side had a beef with Timothy. Especially the Jews would have a difficult time accepting Timothy's ministry with them and to them. In their eyes, he was an uncircumcised Gentile. Why would they trust him? So what Paul did is nicely explained by F.F. F. Bruce. 
Paul therefore regularized his status and in Jewish eyes legitimized him by circumcising him. Timothy had been brought up to observe the Jewish law. It was the simple expediency that suggested the circumcising of one who was already a half Jew with a view to his greater usefulness in the ministry of the gospel. In such a case, circumcision was merely a minor surgical operation performed for a practical purpose and not a religious rite. Now the difficulty here, and especially for biblical scholars of our own day, is that Paul elsewhere speaks in no uncertain terms against circumcision. That's in part because of the dispute that had just concluded with the Judaizers from Antioch. Remember that they had argued that one must be circumcised and follow the entire Mosaic law in order to be saved. And Paul and Barnabas had disputed their salvation through circumcision theology. And then at the Jerusalem Council, the apostles had heard arguments pro and con about circumcision. They decided that circumcision was not necessary for a Gentile to be a true Christian. And so in their deliverance, in this letter, which was now being circulated by Paul, there's no requirement for circumcision. Add to this that in Galatia, the Judaizers had made much trouble by teaching that circumcision was needful for salvation. And so in his letter to the Galatians, Paul is quite strong. He says in Galatians 5, Behold, I, Paul, say to you that if you receive circumcision, Christ will be of no benefit to you. And I testify again to every man who receives circumcision that he is under obligation to keep the whole law. That's strong language. And then on top of all that, there's the case of Titus, who was an uncircumcised Greek whom Paul brought to Jerusalem at one point. And Paul says, Titus was not compelled to be circumcised. So we come back to the question, why circumcise Timothy? If Paul's so strong against it, and he won't apply that to Titus. Why do this? Uh, this isn't just one of those made up scholarly problems that has no real basis. They just, because scholars like to argue with each other. No, there's a real question here. Why does Paul do this? Well, again, I think Bruce's assessment is absolutely correct. In this case, it is merely a minor surgical operation performed for a practical purpose and not a religious rite. You might say this was fairly meaningless outpatient surgery, not a sacrament. And this is done for practical reasons. It certainly was no means of salvation for young Timothy. Paul is not trying to save Timothy through circumcision. Paul simply did it to normalize and regularize Timothy's status in order to enable him to minister effectively to both Jew and Gentile. Now to be fair to Paul, this is a problem that Paul inherited from Timothy's parents, and especially probably Timothy's father. If Timothy's father had been a proselyte or even a God-fearer and allowed Eunice to have the boy circumcised, Timothy would be circumcised. There would be no discussion. There would be no problem. But the fact that the parents failed for whatever reason, again, I think it's the dad, this means that now Paul has a problem. He's got this gifted young man who he wants to take into the team for ministry. He's ordained by the presbytery, 
But there's this pragmatic issue of his status with circumcision. Go ahead and do the outpatient surgery and let's take care of this so that as we go forth ministering to Jew and Gentile, nobody's going to say, oh, but Timothy. You know, really, Timothy's status as circumcised or uncircumcised doesn't matter at all in the long run. But in order to take away cause for objection, he says, let's just get this handled, and then it's not a question ever again. Dr. Simon Kistemacher sums it up well. He says, in the case of Timothy, being a good Christian did not mean being a bad Jew. Paul himself wanted to be all things to all people so that he might win both Jew and Gentile for Christ. He expected that Timothy, a fellow missionary, would do the same. Hence, Paul circumcised him to remove any hindrance to furthering the cause of Christ. And I think that's, that's it. He's making a very practical decision so that Timothy can be all things to all men. And his situation is normalized, and his status among Jews is legitimized, and now he can minister without any question. You know, so often when it comes to issues of this sort, it immediately becomes black or white. And what that ends up being is the good guys versus the bad guys. And who the good guys and who the bad guys are depend on which side of the issue you're on. But in matters of this sort, there are often very subtle nuances that need to be fully understood and appreciated so that wise and good decisions can be made. I fear that our country is turning more and more into an absolute black and white country. And I'm not talking racial issues here. I'm not talking skin color. I'm talking about absolute us versus them in everything, in every way. You know, to some extent, this has existed within our society. You know, either you're a Cubs fan or you're a Sox fan. Either you're a Packers fan or you're a Bears fan. Yeah, there are understandable divisions. But never to this amount where it is the righteous versus the unrighteous. In everything, in every way. And each side is claiming to be the righteous and looking at the other side as the reprobates. And, and as that polarization and division gets deeper and deeper and more settled into our culture, we are at civil war within our own nation. I saw yesterday that a third of people in our country favor dividing up our nation along ideological lines into separate countries. That's how deep it is getting. And, and you see, in this situation, as in most ecclesiastical issues, as in e even a lot of civil issues, there's a lot of gray area in the middle that needs to be considered and not just tribal warfare. And so when we come to a question like minimum wage, do we just break out into pro and con, for and against, conservative and liberal? Uh, we, we're losing our ability as a nation, as a culture, to say, let's try, talk about the pros and cons of this. Let's think about this. Let's dialogue between ourselves about this. And so in this particular instance, I could see some saying, Paul is an apostate because he circumcised Timothy. And people lining up against Paul for this very reason. And on the other side, people with equally strong opinions praising Paul for this as if he's finally seen the light. Paul holds that middle course, and he does the wise and prudent thing
for the cause of Christ in this world. Well, there is also something here in the text which I really like, and I end with this. There's a neat little literary device that one of my seminary professors was especially fond of. He was always talking about the inclusio. So an inclusio is a literary device that acts like bookends at the beginning and end of a section. It introduces and then it concludes. And we have an inclusio here in our text. If you back up one verse to chapter 15, verse 41, and if you look at that verse, it says, he was traveling through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. And then we have verses one through four, and then in verse five, so the churches were being strengthened in the faith and we're increasing in number daily. So here are the bookends. Strengthening the churches. Strengthening the churches. The churches are being strengthened. Well, this is an important thing, not only for their day, but for our day. Churches, and I'm talking here about new churches, young churches, weak churches, small churches, all churches need strengthening. The Lord builds and bolsters his church on earth. And therefore the need is always present. Every church needs strengthening at all times. The church that believes it is sufficiently strong and needs no further strengthening is a church that will soon cave in on itself. And let's be more particular and specific. Our church needs strengthening. And the churches of our presbytery need strengthening. And the Orthodox Presbyterian Church as a body needs strengthening. We all need to be strengthened. So how does this strengthening go on? What does it look like? I think in our text we find some clues. And first of all, the church is strengthened by the ordination and commissioning of Timothy as a missionary and minister of the gospel. The very act of setting apart one of their own young men for ministry would strengthen any faithful body of believers. I can't help but think about Elijah. And what a joy it has been to our congregation, not just to our family, but to our congregation, to see him go off to seminary, to do well in seminary, to have those summer internships, and now to hear reports from Grant's past that he is really doing well in his year-long internship. And now he's candidated and he's awaiting a possible call. It is very possible that Elijah could be ordained this summer. And if it were possible, I would love for all of us to go to his ordination service. And you see, one of our own, a, a son of the congregation, one who grew up in our midst, now being set apart and ordained to the gospel ministry, doesn't that just cheer your heart to, to see how God is using our church in the advancement of the gospel through this young man, who, by the way, is becoming a stronger and better preacher almost by the week? Tune in to the live stream from Grant's Pass, and you'll see his preaching skills have really risen significantly over the last nine months. And so as Timothy is set apart, this strengthens the churches. And, and that's not even to say anything about Timothy's future ministry as he goes out and as he ministers here, there, and everywhere. And as he carries out the ministry to which he was ordained, that too strengthens the churches. So churches are strengthened by the ordination of young men to ministry. That's one way. 
Well, another way in which they were strengthened was the deliverance of the Jerusalem council. As Paul and Silas passed through the cities and visited the churches, they were delivering the decrees that had been decided upon by the apostles and elders at the Jerusalem council for them to follow. So they were explaining the thinking behind the decisions, the rationale for the recommended restrictions upon the Gentiles. They were taking the Jerusalem deliverance and they were applying it to the Gentile churches. This wasn't just for Antioch, it was for all of the Gentile congregations. And just as this had brought great rejoicing to the church in Antioch, it also provided serious strengthening to the Gentile churches throughout the southern region of Galatia. Which is just to say that the work of the church, especially through her courts, can bring encouragement and strength to local churches. That's why when we have a presbytery meeting, the next Sunday I try to report to you what happened at presbytery. When I go to General Assembly on occasion, I try to bring back a report of what the General Assembly did. Because the work of the church helps the churches grow strong in their commitments. Furthermore, they were strengthened through doctrinal teaching. Now when it says in verse 5 that they were being strengthened in the faith, that means in the faith objectively considered. This is really not about their subjective experience of faith, though that was also growing, but rather they were being trained up in the faith once for all delivered to the saints. In other words, the doctrinal truths of the Christian religion. Doctrinal training is a great way to strengthen churches. But when there is a neglect of sound doctrine, churches grow weaker and weaker as a result. Now sometimes I'll encounter complaints, not from you all, but from other sources, that I'm too doctrinal. Too much doctrinal emphasis. Uh, you're just so dusty and dry with your doctrine. Uh, honestly, I don't think that's true of me, but you know, sometimes that mud has been thrown at me. I'm not going to apologize for doctrine, for teaching sound doctrine. And you shouldn't apologize for it either. Sound doctrine is the meat and potatoes for the soul. It's what you need to consume if you want to be healthy and strong and grow as a Christian. This whole idea that you can be fuzzy on doctrine and be kind of indifferent on doctrine because doctrine divides, so they say, is hogwash. We need sound doctrine. That sound pattern of words which the apostles gave and put into the New Testament and which we then relish as we enjoy it. Take time to read and study doctrine and you will grow as a result and the church will be stronger and stronger. You know, this morning we used the Westminster Creed, which is based on our Westminster standards. And just as we read through that together, there's a strengthening effect of dwelling ever so briefly on those beautiful truths of our Westminster standards. Not that they're the Bible, not that they're inspired, but they are a good, solid summary of what the Bible teaches. Sound doctrine has its place, and it brings strength to churches. You look at churches where they have completely thrown doctrine out the window, and all they talk about is love and how to do this, that, and the next thing by following 12 easy steps, and you will find a weak church that is foundering. Now, doctrine can and should be presented in a lively fashion. It should not be dull. 
It should not be a theological lecture. It should be taught and preached with passion. Because real sound doctrine sets the soul aflame. And when it is preached with that kind of intensity, it stirs up the faith of believers. And it instructs their minds and guides their wills. And so sound doctrinal teaching was strengthening them as well. And then the last way that they were being strengthened was through evangelism. Notice in verse 5 that it says the churches were increasing in number daily. Both officers and members were actively sharing their faith with their unbelieving friends, neighbors, and acquaintances. And God was using them to save souls. And as souls were saved, the church was strengthened and it increased and grew. You see, evangelism is also needful if we will see churches go strong in the Lord. And so all of these various things are kind of coming together as the perfect storm to cause the churches to thrive and grow. And that's what we need in our church. We need that constant diet of true and sound doctrine. We need to be active in evangelism locally with our neighbors and friends and acquaintances and coworkers and colleagues. And we need to be rejoicing to see one of our own being set apart for ministry. And as these things are kind of ongoing in our midst, our church grows stronger and stronger. And isn't that what we want? Do we want a, a weak, compromised church that has no backbone, that has no conviction, that has no impact in the community? Is that what we'd settle for? No, we want a vibrant strong, thriving church, which is a force to be reckoned with for the glory of God. Let's pray. Lord, grow us in your strength by the means that you have appointed to the glory and honor of your great name. For we pray in Jesus' name, amen.